Okay, everybody, welcome to week one. Uh, what we'll do on some of these is that we will have a lecture and a lecture about the chapters in uh, this class. And then um, there's also a study guide attached to each week to help you prepare for the weekly quizzes that we have. Okay, so out of the first chapter of Irony of Democracy, it kind of talks a little bit about the development of our country. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about something called the Iron Law of Oligarchy. We're going to talk about elitism. We're going to talk about pluralism. We're going to talk about how they overlap. And then we're going to talk about how elitism, elitism currently occurs in our representative democracy. And then we'll try to explain why the title of the book is The Irony of Democracy. It's a really interesting question. So what is democracy? Um, democracy is basically government by the people, for the people, all of that stuff. And in order for our democracy to survive, we need the elites to be able to stay in control and also keep the masses happy. And that's how our democracy functions. You know, we could always vote the elites out if we're unhappy with it. But as we'll see, there's going to be some passivity to the way people get involved in voting and participation. So elites are the ones that have power. The masses do not have much power. Um, power, and I will always like to find, you know, there's a couple of definitions of power. Uh, power is deciding who gets what, when, and how. And I also like to kind of look at power as getting somebody to do something that they don't want to do. And I think that's another form of power, right? And this whole concept of these theories that we're going to be focusing on, we're going to be focusing on elitism and pluralism. And elitism is the theory that we're going to you know, primarily take a look at where society focuses on the few who have those, that power, their values, their behavior, and their demographics and what makes the you know, kind of the elite circle up. And it could be anybody from a Trump to a Biden to an Obama to a Bush, down to a Kardashian, and then all of us. So elites will govern all parts of a society. They're going to be small in number and perform functions. They'll monopolize power and enjoy the advantages that that power brings to them. Individuals, they'll focus on maintaining their positions as elites, as we know if somebody is a an elite that has, you know, not maybe um maybe experience some of the hardships of the real world that many of us have uh they might not do so well i always like to say maybe let's take kim, kim kardashian's uh wealth in her fame away and give her two thousand dollars a month to or let's say three thousand dollars a month to live uh she probably wouldn't know how to do it so it behooves them to become and to stay a part of that elite circle and as the group elites are going to agree on the rules of the game, and they may even change the rules of the games at times to preserve their political and their social system. Now, I don't want to seem really kind of pessimistic about this, but it'll start to make sense when we go through all of this. So the basis of elite consensus are the sanctity and of you know, kind of things that our country was built on. Kind of the John Locke belief that we all have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, right? So if we talk to elites and see what their consensus is about what may be uh, you know, sacred here in our country, they may say individual liberty, private property, and living in government. Um, and when we talk about public policy, when we use the term public policy here in this class, that's basically like laws and programs that are put into place for the American people. Generally, when we talk about elites, their demands don't necessarily reflect the will of the people, much like how we kind of learn, come to learn is the vital part of democracy, but rather their own interests and their own values as elites. Doesn't mean the mass the masses are going to be repressed. Um, the elites are going to assume that the masses are passive, apathetic, and ill-informed, and I don't think that is too far of a stretch to make that assumption. You know, we don't have a lot of people voting. Why? Because they're apathetic. People don't participate in politics. Why? Because they're passive. A lot of us are ill-informed. It's hard to be able to tell who our representative in Congress is or who our two senators are. A lot of people don't know this. And, you know, the elites kind of rely on the masses, you know, kind of being ignorant. And, like, I'm not going to use ignorant kind of in a negative term here. Ignorance just means you're not totally knowledgeable about a subject. So, obviously, there's going to be people who aren't totally knowledgeable 
about parts of politics and that kind of plays into the elites relying that the masses are going to be passive and apathetic and no informed and these elites are going to influence us more than we influence them so when we talk about popular participation in the allocation of values in society uh, you know, one thing is individual dignity that we rely on. Uh, when we talk about democracy, obviously, when we talk about values, those are resources that we may be entitled to as a as a people. Um, but you know, in our in, in our world, in, in our in our in our kind of our situation here in the United States, we do go very much off of a majority rule type feeling. But you know, kind of within the 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 classic Federalist Ten belief of James Madison is that in order for a democracy to be truly functional you need to have majority rule but at the other end you need to have respect for the minority and we're not talking about ethnic minority anything like that we're talking basically people who are going to be in the 49 percent below in, in any type of, of vote or any type of decision by congress so the majority will rule here in the united states but the minority's rights have to be protected and that's why we have our system of courts and all that stuff. And we'll look at that in, in the future. A lot of our, our <clears throat> a lot of our, our belief system here in the United States is based off of John Locke's classic liberal theory. And classic liberalism focuses on the fact that we have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, which are independent of the government, and the government's purpose is to protect that liberty. And be a neutral arbitrator, right, in making decisions or making judgments against people. And with that, we form a social contract with the government. And basically what that says is this co the contract is that we as citizens will give up certain rights as part of that social contract. But in order for the government to effectively govern us, they have to protect our life liberty and property so we consent to government rule but in turn the government needs to protect our life liberty and property rights go ahead and move on a bit and we talk a little bit here's a good side by side for you to look at um you know kind of the differences between classic liberalism and modern liberalism remember classic liberalism is not the modern liberalism that we have today it's very different if we wanted to, to kind of compare classic liberalism to an ideology today, it'd probably be a libertarian type thought where, you know, you're socially liberal but economically conservative. So looking at the side by side, we could see the differences between classic liberalism versus modern liberalism. And we don't really want to get these two mixed up. While classic liberalism is going to influence both um, uh, conservatism and modern liberalism, uh, it's totally different uh, type of liberalism that exists from now, and I want to really uh, enforce that. So when we talk about the meaning of democracy, everybody is supposed to be equal before the law. Uh, we're also supposed to be equal politically. One person, one vote. All our vote counts the same. right? Now, there's kind of a, 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 dispar a, a disparity in thinking about equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome we're going to come and revisit equality of outcome later in class but equality of opportunity is kind of you know equity is trying to get people to be able to be whatever they want to be in life without any type of barriers and the government is supposed to ensure that so equality of opportunity is developing the extent of one's capabilities where nothing gets in their way to pursue a life of happiness. The founders also believe that government will rest on the consent of the governed and envision decision making by representatives of the people. And this is where we get our representative democracy ideas from. We elect people to go to Washington, D.C. to to. Uh, um, make decisions based off of our interests. But as we're going to look in future chapters, we're going to see that sometimes um, these decision makers will make decisions that benefit their own self-interest or special interests. And we'll talk about what special interest is in a minute. Um, or actually in later in class. Uh, uh, probably right around when we get to talking about interest groups. 
direct democracy, we're going to address it in a little bit. So go ahead and hold off for that. So we talked a little bit about ruling, ruling by the consent of masses through institutions of representation inevitably leads to elitism. So people like Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, uh, Devin Nunes are all part of Congress, but they're also part of the elite, no matter what party they're a, a member of. So, you know, technically at times we have a trust in government, but as we could see by this graph, uh, the trust in government has gone down significantly since the 60s. Um, you know, if we asked, if anybody asked you, do you trust your government? I mean, I think a lot of people would say no. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's one of the things about being a part of this country is that you need to question your government. And I don't think there's anything un-American or anything wrong with that. So let's talk about pluralism. And pluralism is kind of the, the other side of the theory that we're going to be working off of. So... The belief in pluralism is that democratic values can be preserved by having groups come together and argue and advocate for their positions. Um, voters exercise meaningful choices in elections, and this might lead to a to a point where elites, new elites, can gain access to power. Mass participation is not possible. Decision making must be accomplished through elite interaction rather than individual participation. And these countervailing centers of elite power can check each other and keep interest from abusing this power. And we're going to talk about, you know, kind of Madison 50, Federalist 51 and the separation of powers doctrine and his belief that one portion of the government can't be too, uh, can't be stronger than the other. So the legislative branch can't be stronger than the judicial branch. The judicial branch can't be stronger by the executive than the executive branch. And we're going to actually get into a discussion later about whether or not the there are institutions within government that are more powerful than the others. They're not supposed to be, but I do think there's one that has kind of evolved. And, you know, this is a scene from Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, right? And this is the opening scene where, uh, not the opening scene, but a couple of minutes into the scene where they uh, have the different tribes from Wakanda come together and argue pluralism and, and argue about different rights and different goals. And when I saw this movie, this this sh showed me and, and kind of it, it uh, you know, kind of led a light bulb off of my head where I say, hey, this is a, a aspect of pluralism. So if you've seen the movie, you'll understand what I'm talking about. If we look at this side by side, it compares elitism versus pluralism. Go ahead and take a look at it and the differences. We're going to go ahead and skip uh, elite distemper. So let's talk about something called mass unrest. Uh, the masses are vulnerable to appeals to intolerance, racial hatred, anti-intellectualism, maybe a class antagonism you know, anti-religious and violence. And we've seen this, you know, you've seen uh, decision makers and members of Congress or, you know, people that have been in the Oval Office try to appeal to the masses by maybe, in a sense, scaring them or, in a sense, of maybe repressing what the masses can read or what the masses can intake. Because remember, once you start learning stuff and you start opening your worldview, your mind will open as well, right? And we have demagogues at, at times where, you know, these are people that try to de diminish or delegitimize the system. You know, Trump may be considered a demagogue, Bernie Sanders, uh, even AOC at, the, at this time. So the belief is democratic values can only survive if there is an absence of mass political activism or that kind of that 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 segment or that issue of of you know, people not participating, people being passive. Mass unrest will in in inspire elite repression. And we're going to kind of look at this through the course of our, our, our summer where we're going to see that at times when there is a national crisis or there's a war or there's an economic you know, downturn, uh, at times, elites will repress our rights. And we may be okay with it 
at in some instances. But we'll go ahead and and really analyze the fact of you know is there stuff that we are prohibited from doing because government because government says no, and then we may think that's an inalienable right like speech or assembly or dissent. Um, can the government? You know, repress these rights that we here see in the Constitution based off of law and order. All societies are governed by elites. Elite theory seeks to explain the ways elites function in our democracy. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump to talking a little bit about the colonial experience. We're going to go back and forth between political science and history. This is the history part. So we had, during the colonial experience prior to the Declaration of Independence being signed, we had royal colonies. And royal colonies were ruled by an administrator or by a governor that was appointed by the King of England, right? So they were kind of sub, kind of subservient. And here are some, ish, uh, uh, some examples of states that were royal colonies. Uh, the government and the royal colonies was based on the principles. You know, they were ruled by British monarchs, and the king had control all over, all over unsold public lands, and the governor had the power to allocate those lands. But remember, the governor was going to be very subservient to the crown. And we also have charter colonies, right? A charter colony is a is 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 governed by a, a written document. A charter might be some type of constitution or some type of rule of law. A charter is written from the sovereign power of a country that bestows certain rights and privileges to that colony. Uh, charter colonies were written co contracts between the crown as well as the American colonists defining the share each should have in the government and were not to be changed without each party consenting to that change. And if we look at this, this was a model for the U.S. Constitution. And we see three states here that would be considered charter colonies. The final one that we have is a proprietary colony. And these were territories granted by the king to one or more proprietors who had full governing rights over that area. They were granted governmental powers over a tract of land and Proprietary colonies were run under a colonial charter agreement, which were reviewed by the king. Uh, the leaders here were called governors or lord proprietors in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware are good examples of this. And here's a little bit of a chart to show you, and I think this is a good illustration. Now, we also had a sense of a monopoly over mercantilism. And basically, the, the, the English crown had a monopoly over the seas, over the land. The Navigation Acts were a series of English laws that restricted colonial trade to England so, that, so the colonists weren't able to trade with other countries. This was enacted in 1651 and lasted to 16, uh, throughout the time until 1663, and then it was eventually repealed. They reflected the policy of mercantilism, which sought to keep all benefits of trade inside the British Empire and to minimize the loss of gold and silver to foreigners. So in a sense, kind of, of, of hoarding all the riches, in a sense. At the time, a gentleman named uh, Edmund, well, at the time, the, the English crown uh, practiced something called salutary neglect or a healthy neglect. So a lot of the times when uh, in the mid 18th centuries, North American colonies weren't really regulated that much. And if they were, it was laxly enforced by uh, the king. Uh, so there was kind of a, a healthy neglect. And this was coined by a gentleman named Sir Edmund Burke. And then, you know, we kind of this kind of started to see a pattern of revolution here um, in order for the, the Brit. Uh, the British government to to pay off the debt from the French and Indian War, they started enacting taxes on the colonists, which really upset the colonists because they didn't have any representation in government. One of the first things they did was the Sugar Act. This was an act on uh, that, that set a tax on sugar, molasses, and imported into the colonies, which impacted the manufacturing of rum. The Sugar Act also taxed wines, coffees, cambric, uh, printed material, timber and iron were included in the products that could be only traded with England. So you could see the colonists, they could not really profit too much from any type of merchandise or any type of goods that they had. 
We also had the Currency Act and the Stamp Act. The Currency Act regulated currency and colonies. The Stamp Act was opposed on all American colonists and required them to pay a tax on every piece of uh, paper they used, whether it was a ship's papers or some type of legal documentation or a license or a, a, a newspaper or other publications. And even playing cards were taxed. Kind of the tipping point was the Tea Act. This was passed by English Parliament on May 10th, 1773, and it granted the British East India Company Tea a monopoly on tea sales in the American colonies. And remember, when we have a monopoly, at times, businesses that are monopolized can charge as much as they want. Right? This was used as a revenue stream to help England recover from the cost of the French and Indian War. Eventually, revolution came out and we kind of came toward the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson that was very much influenced by John Locke. And it kind of also creates what is called the American Dilemma that we'll look at in a future class. Uh, Jefferson wrote, we hold these, self, these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator certain inalienable rights, that among us these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So you can also see kind of Jefferson's, you know, kind of savviness in maybe tweaking that John Locke theory from life, liberty, and property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because if we all had an individual right to property, then more people would have been enfranchised. Because remember, at that time, the only people that can vote were white men with property. So, you know, we originally had the Articles of Confederation kind of as a governing document. But the Articles of Confederation was basically a treaty between sovereign nations, right? It established that firm league of friendship among the states for their defense, security of their liberties, and protecting the general welfare of the people. These articles proved to be weak, right? At this time, the powers delegated to the United States were, you know, kind of what we have now, declaring war, sending and receiving ambassadors, and so on. The states had the powers to regulate commerce and levying taxes. So when we talk about regulation and taxes here in this class, they're going to be looked at as revenue generators for the government, right? The governor, government will make money off of this. So, you know, one thing to make, uh, you know, uh, uh, to collect taxes, the states were making money through collecting taxes and regulating commerce, and there was really no way for the American uh, national economy to develop. As part of, you know, the, the Articles of Confederation, there was no executive or judicial branch, so no checks and balances. Uh, weak state governors, uh, no powers of the central government to tax or to regulate interstate trade, so no revenue generators. And then we had Shays' Rebellion, which exposed the government's weakness, where a series of, a, a series of protests in 1786 and 1787 by farmers actually scared the government. Um, Rebels tried to capture the federal arsenal at Springfield. They were a bunch of people that were debtors. And back then, if you had debt, you could possibly go to debtor's prison. At that time, they captured the federal arsenal at Springfield in Springfield, Mass, Massachusetts, harassed merchants, lawyers, and supporters of the state government. And this scared politicians because they really had no way to, to approach this. So as a result of this, we started to have a situation where a new constitution was going to be developed. The Alexandria Conference in, in, in Maryland and Virginia met and dealt with navigation and commerce issues. The Annapolis meeting in Maryland met where we had 12, 12 delegates from five states adopt a report outlining these defects that we just talked about. They were looking to revise the Articles of Confederation, but instead they wrote a whole new constitution. We also saw a form of the national elite. Uh, you know, these are one of the the, the kind of the, the 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 tipping points or the starting point. Sorry, not tipping point. The starting point of an elite system here in the United States, where we had George Washington, who was at the apex of our elite structure, and a lot of these governing uh, people had experience. You know, making key decisions in government, controlling Congress, participating in the revolution, and so on. A lot of them were educated at prestigious institutions, which kind of plays into that elitism. And a lot of them were wealthy. And you can see what, um, here what 
industries they were a part of. And they had a really strong national view, right? And when we look at the word nationalism, it's going to be used in a couple of different ways. Uh, when we hear the word nationalism, or, or when I hear the word nationalism, I think of the Nazis, right? But also, you know, it, it, it could be classified as an intense love for your country, or you're willing to maybe compromise some of your values. And they all had a strong belief that we needed a strong national government with the power to exercise its will directly on the people. Kind of, you know, taking out that instance where the federal government could go in and form that social contract with people to get them to consent to being governed, but in turn also protecting their rights. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the next chapter. So we're going to talk about the origins of the Constitution, how a Republican form of government uh, was formed, uh, kind of discuss the negotiations that were needed to, to have the Constitution passed, uh, talk about the importance of e economic stability, and then talk a little bit about how checks and balances start. So we look at this picture, we could see kind of the hierarchy that existed in our new country, right? Uh, let's go ahead and skip Hobbes. Um, Hobbes basically thought, you know, kind of made the comment that people were naturally prone to conflict. And in a sense, you need that social contract to kind of keep people in line. Locke, the same, you know, kind of the same thing. You know, uh, we thought that when a person is in their state of nature and state of nature is where there's no corrupting values or corrupting uh, influence on us, um, that we as people would have no security and rights and would leave, live in fear of an attack or an invasion. So in a sense, we had to form that contract with the government in order for them to protect us. And with that being said, we need to give up some individual rights. And Luck also felt that individuals who form a government would need some type of neutral judge or neutral arbitrator acting to protect the lives, liberty, and property of those who lived in it. Now, when we talk about protecting liberty, uh, one of the things that uh, was kind of the belief is equality meant equality under the law and equality of opportunity, not necessarily equality of outcome. So we're not going to kind of get into that socialist point of view, right, um, where equality doesn't mean equal in wealth, intelligence, virtue, or talent, you know, kind of not distributing, redistributing the wealth. Uh, founders didn't believe government had a responsibility to reduce these inequalities. And, you know, I think we still kind of fight to try to reduce inequalities uh, as individuals, right? And at times, you know, the government will step in and become that neutral arbitrator if a we believe a right is being violated. There was a consensus in 1787 that we needed a Republican form of government. And it's not Republican Party, but it's a Republican form of government where we had a representative democracy that was responsible and non-hereditary. So something very different from England, non-hereditary, right? No aristocracy, a system of mass democracy. Expected the masses to consent to government by men of principle and poverty. We would elect those that are wise and prudent. And they would represent our interest in Washington, D.C. And as part of that, the founders also believed that we needed a limited government that couldn't threaten life or liberty or property. And dividing these governments into separate bodies, which should be capable of checking one another and should not pose a threat to the other. Uh, this is really much a very James Madison point of view. And you'll read Federalist 51. Um, James Madison was an advocate and one of the kind of the... the the critical thinkers that really put forth a thought of the positivity of having the separation of powers. Uh, one of the classic things is if men were angels, you wouldn't need government. And we're going to re revisit this uh, that term in a little bit. So in negotiating the Constitution, there was a, a concept of... The fact that how are we going to handle representation? So there were two plans that originally came out. The Virginia plan 
and the New, New Jersey plan, right? The Virginia plan was a plan that called for much, you know, like the English parliament, where you have a lower house that is chosen by citizens, and then uh, the upper house is chosen by the lower house. Congress would have the ability to, to nullify state laws, so the Congress acting as a judicial branch. And in this parliamentary form of government, Congress would choose executive and judicial branches. The New Jersey plan basically looked at a one vote per state house. So unicameral house, separate executive and judiciary, and also giving the powers of Congress to include the right to tax and to regulate commerce. So definitely something that will generate revenue. This led to something called the Connecticut Compromise, right? And in the Connecticut Compromise, we saw this two-house legislature come together with the lower house based on population. And at that time, the upper would be equal where we have two senators per state. Um, so our representation in house, the house is based off of population. But also remember that the Senate is going to be equal in each state. So we have two senators in California. Obviously, California was in a was in a state at this time. So, but if we put it in moderating terms, we had two representatives in 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 California, and you would have two representatives in Rhode Island. So, kind of an equal uh, form of representation. Now, slavery also needed to be addressed in the Constitution. So, there were a couple uh, three things that came out of this. The first thing is the three fifths compromise. So, slaves were counted as three fifths of a person for representation and appropriation, appropriating direct taxes only. So slaves still didn't have rights. They were considered property. And we'll look at a, a, a decision called Dred Scott later in, in, the, in the term. But for the purposes of representation only, slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person. Uh, Congress prohibited the slave trade, but not before, 19, uh, before 1808. And Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution guaranteed that returns the, the return of escaped slaves. So definitely slavery was addressed. We also had trade and commerce compromises. You know, under the articles, uh, the development of the national economy was being impaired a bit. Uh, Southern planners feared that Congress may impose export taxes, so there was a compromise where articles exported from any state should bear no tax. And only imports could be taxed by the national government to protect the U.S. industries against foreign goods. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the concept of tariffs and the protection of, of, of industries here in the United States later in the class. Also had to decide how voting was going to be done. So you did, uh, the founders didn't want mass voting participation, right? So... What has been decided is here in the United States, you know, the Constitution basically says that anybody that's an American citizen and is over 18 can vote. But then they also kind of give the, the, the power to states to decide if there are certain things or certain actions that have happened that might prevent a person from voting, whether it's breaking, you know, it's committing a felony or whatever. Um, so it is the states that determine eligibility if someone can vote or not. And obviously, at this time, women were not given the right to vote. And the only thing that we as citizens could vote on that time was for House of Representatives. Remember, the House of Representatives voted for the Senate. And we indirectly choose the president through the Electoral College. Uh, we also had taxation. So the go Congress was granted the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. These are all revenue generators. It enabled the national government to, it, to kind of end its dependence on states. And Article 6 committed the U.S. to paying off all investors who held bonds. Uh, usually if the government, government needs money, they'll sell bonds. You know, it, it's a very uh, safe investment for people. Uh, you give the government money, they'll give you a certain interest rate, and then when that bond matures, you get that money back. In the meantime, the, the government will use that money to try to fund some type of project. Money and credit also had to be protected. Article 1, Section 8 enables Congress to protect money and property. Things were made as far as bankruptcy laws. So if you ever have to claim bankruptcy, it will be done in federal court. Congress in the United States is the only one that could coin money and regulate the value of that money. Uh, they would have a fixed standard weights and measures. So if a pound in Maryland 
was existent, you should ha it should be the same as a pound in Rhode Island. Uh, you know, punishing counterfeiting, establishing a post office, and passing copyright and patent laws. So these are all things that can protect money and property here in the United States that were established in Article 1, Section 8. We also started to see people move out west. Um, uh, or kind of incur uh, Native Americans discouraged immigration out west, even though we still did see it. And then a military was created, right? Article 1, Section 8, and Article 2 provides centralized diplomatic and military affairs at the national level. So if we have to deal with a country with diplomatic ties, it'll be done by the federal government only. Uh, we also needed a strong Navy to protect U.S. commerce because piracy was a real danger. Uh, a national army and na Navy weren't not so much protection against evasion, but it was more of a protection uh, and promotion of government's com you know, commercial and their territorial ambitions. We also needed to protect against revolution, right? National Army and Navy provided protection against class wars and debtor rebellions, much like what we saw in Shays' Rebellion. And Article 4, Section 4, our national government guarantees to every state a Republican form of government as well as protection against domestic violence. So again, we're starting to see this social contract forming. Article 6 also issued what was called the Supremacy Clause. Laws of Congress supersede laws of states, would make it certain Congress would control interstate commerce, bankruptcy, monetary affairs, and so on. So we have instances where we may have laws that are legal in states but illegal on the federal level. Uh, the marijuana law is a good example of this. Marijuana is a Schedule I narcotic, but you know, as determined by the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. Um, but here in California, marijuana is legal for both recreational and uh, medicinal purposes. So in a sense, you know, federal government, this law will trump state law. So if the federal government wanted to come into California and shut down all the dispensaries, they would be within their right to do that. Because remember, federal law will supersede state law. And we also saw republicanism in operation where we have our House members elected to two-year terms. Our Senate to six year terms. We elect the president indirectly through electors, which we'll talk about. And federal judges were appointed to be on the bench for life. And we'll talk maybe about some of the consequences of that. So, one of your essays here is going to be about the concept of separation of powers. And in Federalist 51, James Madison kind of laid out his argument for separation of powers. As this was a safeguard against having a majoritarian government and also, in a sense, to protect elite liberty and property and prevent that tyranny of the majority, right? Each major decision-making body here in, in, in government is chosen by a different constituency. And they have checks that they could impose on each other. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So this is a very, very prophetic statement. He's basically saying that, you know, people aren't angels, so we need laws. And we need, you know, to be able to have trust in government. Now, if we look at kind of where the evolution of, of the thought of the concept of judicial review... Uh, Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court gave themselves the power to not only invalidate state laws, but also any laws of Congress that may conflict with the Constitution. So in a sense, the Supreme Court can determine what's constitutional and what's not constitutional. We also had a faction of anti-federalists, right? Federalists are people that think we need a strong central government and the states to be subservient. Anti-federalist is kind of the opposite. They felt that this took prestige and power from state and local governments. It threatened civil liberties, and it was a disguised monarchy. So we saw the Constitution ratified on September 17, 1787. The Constitutional Convention sent the Constitution to Congress, and it was ratified. Let's have the Bill of Rights passed, and this was kind of a, you know, a, a bunch of rights that were put into place to protect us from the government. It was penned by Madison in response to call, it was a response to call from several states for creating, 
greater constitutional protection for individual liberties. You know, in the Bill of Rights, we have things like the First Amendment, where it protects our speech and our religion and our assembly, or the Second Amendment, which prevents uh, abuse of the right to bear arms. Uh, the Fifth Amendment guarantees us due process. Uh, the Sixth Amendment gu guarantees us a right to trial and a right to an attorney. So all of these rights that are within the Bill of Rights are put in place to protect our, ourselves from the government. So when you get a chance, look at that link and look at some of the rights that we have and think, have, have any of these rights ever been kind of compromised? California as well has a constitution. Remember, this constitution cannot override the federal constitution or the U.S. constitution. This has been amended 48 times. And when we look at direct democracy, we'll see ways to, to change the constitution here in California. But it's very difficult to change the constitution at the federal level. So, you know, when we talk about separation of powers and the system of checks and balances... Uh, you know, it was pretty much put into place that, you know, you don't want any body of government being stronger than the other. And this checks and balances system would be kind of a counter counterbalancing influence by which an organization or a system is regulated. The problems with this, it can create gridlock, right? You know, the president has the ability to check Congress by a veto. Uh, Congress can override the president's veto with a two-thirds majority vote. If there's a law that's passed by Congress and the president vetoes it, Congress can override it, like I said. But also the judicial branch, if they see that law and believe it to be unconstitutional, they can declare it unconstitutional. But in a sense, if a law is declared unconstitutional, one way to make it constitutional is to make a constitutional amendment. And that's a very difficult thing to do. So some of the examples of executive checks are the president can veto laws by Congress. They appoint federal judges, cabinet, and department heads. This has to be confirmed by the Senate and also can issue executive orders which have the weight of policy or have the weight of law. An example of that is Trump's travel ban that he implemented right when he became president or the internment of Japanese Americans in 1942. The legislative branch can override the president's veto with a two-thirds vote like we talked about. They confirm president appointments and we, we're, we'll look at some of the, the, the politics in that. Uh, they can impeach the president. We saw that happen twice in the past four years. And they can also check the judicial branch by proposing a constitutional amendment. Now, the courts, remember, the courts granted the power of judicial review through Marbury versus Madison. And they can rule decisions by the legislative branch and the executive branch unconstitutional. In my opinion, this is the greatest power because it's okay, one way to override a judicial uh, decision or Supreme Court decision is through a constitutional amendment. And we could see how difficult enforcing a constitutional amendment is or passing a constitutional amendment what will happen is there'll be a constitutional question uh convention called and then um two-thirds of congress have to vote in favor of the amendment so that is 66 percent or 353 out of the 535 uh, representatives that we have along with senators um you only need 38 out of 50 states which is 75 percent so you could see the difficulty in passing a constitutional amendment very, very difficult, so difficult that we've only had it 27 times, and the first uh, 10 were done in one shot in 1791. Very, our uh, lecture is the progressive movement here in California and the implementation of direct democracy. And direct democracy is a very interesting thing. You know, California is truly the crossroads of America, right? Uh, Latinos make up a 35% of the population, 60% of that is of uh, Mexican heritage. And we'll see where Latinx people may be the majority in California in the next 10 years. If California was its own country, it would be ranked within the top 10 economies. And, you know, we currently have about 39 million people. So we kind of look at the period where California was, uh, was developed. Um, the Spanish Empire had made several claims to California and sought to consolidate its power in North America as a, as a colonial power. The Spanish colony in Mexico embarked on a war of independence in 1821. Following this successful revolution, the colony won its freedom from Spain. Alta California, which is present-day California, passed quietly into Mexican control. And during this period of Mexican control, we started to see an increased prominence in sea commerce and an expanding migration of Caucasian people and settlers out to 
uh, these areas, um, kind of, you know, pushing the natives. And it was all part of like the, the, something called a manifest destiny, where American settlers supported by a contingent of indigenous Californians revolted against the Mexican government in a movement called the Bear Flag Revolt. The Mexican-American War marked the first U.S. conflict chiefly fought on foreign soil. It pitted a politically divided and military unprepared Mexico against the expanded, you know, the expansionist mindest mindset of the Americans, you know, headed by James Polk, who believed it was our manifest destiny to spread across the continent to the Pacific Ocean. Eventually, the war was won by the United States. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, which ended the Mexican-American War. And it gave about 525,000 square miles to the United States, including parts of California, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, Texas. Uh, the Rio Grande in El Paso is a border also. And we have an, a, a hard border here in San Diego. So, you know, kind of the division between the United States and Mexico. We also saw migration into California through the gold rush, right? There was a discovery of gold nuggets in Sacramento in 1848, which kind of motivated a lot of people to move up to that area to pan for gold. At that time, a total of two billion worth of precious metals were extracted from the area during the gold rush. So we saw a lot of migration out to California. Another thing that existed was the Transcontinental Railroad, right? It was a, a Pacific Railroad Act wanted to combine the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific and, task, and was, they were tasked with building a transcontinental railroad that would link the United States from east to west. This was advantageous as you can move people, you can also move uh, mer merchandise, right? And there was kind of a competition where uh, one side started in Sacramento, one side started in Omaha, and there was a, a, a race to meet in the middle and finally they met at Promontory, Utah in May of 1869. Uh, the Central Pacific was built by Chinese uh, immigrants, numbering more than 50,000. Irish immigrants, as well as Civil War vets and Mexicans, uh, built the Union Pacific. So we look at California currently, for the most part, we're a very democratic state. San Francisco and LA are going to be uh, very liberal. San Diego and Orange County has pockets of liberal and conservative in it. And I think if we even look at different parts of San Diego, you can even break it down even more. If you look at south of the 52, uh, it'd probably be blue. If you look at north of the 52 up into Carlsbad, it'd probably be red. Uh, we'll look more at this when we get into looking at an electoral college. We also have our own state representatives here called the Assembly and the Senate. We have 40 senators along with 80 members of the assembly. They meet in Sacramento and discuss California law. Now, we have this concept that was brought in through the progressive era called direct democracy. You know, is California problematic? Does this power that the people have problematic to our, our system of government? So at the beginning of the progressive era, um, Hiram Johnson, who was governor in 1910, wanted to limit corruption and restore these democratic principles. And in 1911, he added direct democracy to the Constitution, which gave us the ability to do what's called the initiative, the referendum, and the recall. And we'll talk a little bit about these in a minute. Here in California, placing an initiative or a citizen's initiative is relatively easy. Uh, these initiatives are binding, so if the public passes an initiative, uh, the California legislature can amend it. And especially since 1978, we use this process much more than most states. And I think you can probably pretty much agree that when we look at all the propositions that are on the ballot, it's going to be numerous each, you know, every election cycle that we have. So we talked about the initiative a percentage of voters using a petition may have a law or amendment placed on the ballot without legislative involvement. Or we can have a referendum where that legislature might make a decision and wants, want the people of California to, to vote on it to become law. And then we also have the recall, which we're actually seeing in real time now where Governor Newsom is potentially going to be recalled and we're going to see a recall election. We'll talk about that in a few. So there's going to be two types of initiatives. The first one is a state constitution initiative, meaning that here in California, we have the ability as citizens to put a law on the ballot that amends our state constitution. 
right? We also have the ability to, to put statutes, which is proposed directly and becomes law if it's voted by the majority here in California. So we have the ability to put an initiative that will amend the state constitution. And in turn, we also have the ability to pass our own laws here. As long as those laws aren't violations of the federal constitution, they can be uh, put into place. So if we want to get an initiative on the ballot, there's going to be some things that we have to do, right? All you need is an idea and $2,000. You have to submit the text of your law to the California General Attorney General's office. What they'll do is they will take your $2,000 and they will verify whether or not you are able to pass this initiative or get start this initiative. After this review is, is, is put into place, there's a 30-day review. Um, the Attorney General will put a brief circulating the title and summary They'll assign a unique number. This isn't going to be the same number that we see on the ballots like Proposition 64 or Proposition 80 or whatever. The Attorney General will have will have 15 days to complete the petition language. So there has to be some very, uh, you know, legalese type language on the petition for people to go out and get signed. Uh, this period begins after the measure has reviewed a fiscal statement. So one part of that too is that there has to be a review of how much this could potentially cost Californians and California citizens. So once we get our petition approved, um, we can go and start getting signatures, right? So the numbers are, are interesting, and I'm going to want you guys to know these numbers. In order to get an initiative on the ballot, you need X number of votes in the last gubernatorial race to achieve that. So if you want to propose a constitutional initiative, you would need to get 8% of uh, California to sign a petition or 585,000 people. So 8% to change the constitution. If you want to put a new statute or a new law in the place, you need 5% or 365,000. So it does take a lot of effort and a lot of money to get these signatures. Right. There's going to be groups that will pay people to go out to Walmart or to Vons or to Albertsons or whatever to get signatures. Um, you know, they usually pay people for that. And it could be either from, you know, 10 to 20 dollars a signature. So you definitely need financial backing for that. Without one to two million dollars, you cannot get anything on the ballot. Know how popular how it was. And then you can absolutely get some crazy stuff on the ballot like Proposition 6, which prohibited the slaughter of horses and sale of horse meat for human consumption. Once the signatures are collected, once you have that 5% or the 8%, the local registrar will uh, check by a random sample to see if these people are eligible to sign the petition. In order to sign a petition, you have to be a registered voter. They'll check your signature. There might be an instance where they do a full check where they check every person that signed a petition. Uh, they check every person's eligibility. But for the most part, what they'll do is they'll just do a random sampling. They might take every 50 names and make sure they're able to sign. Usually we don't have a, a lot of passages of initiatives here in California. It's roughly about 35% to 40%. If we have an initiative that puts a new tax if it is proposed by by a legislature by the assembly or the senate you need two-thirds of citizens to agree to it so very difficult and you know we're going to look at the charger stadium issue that was uh, prevalent here a few years ago that kind of changed the rules um, if the tax increase is proposed by a citizen you only need 51 percent so if we go out and propose a new tax or a raising of an existing tax uh, we need 51 percent or even a lowering of taxes uh, some of the more controversial propositions are howard jarvis's prop 13. prior to prop 13 property tax was three percent of your assessed value so if you owned a home and your house was worth $100,000, your tax would be $3,000 for a year. Prop 13 limited that to 1% of your assessed value. So instead of paying $3,000, now you're going to be paying $1,000 a year. Now, a lot of people might think that's good. 
um, and it is to you know a homeowner but in a sense you got to also look what is this money being taken away from uh, property taxes used to fund schools fire department police and public services so overnight when prop 13 was passed with 62 percent of the vote all of these tax recipients lost funding and here in california we went first in the nation in education to 48th because uh, we lost about six uh lost about three billion dollars overnight due to this cap on property tax and i have a video that's going to be posted in a module that i want you to watch that talks about prop 13. proposition 8 was a controversial proposition that was passed in 2008 that eliminated rights of same-sex couples to marry um, voters approved a measure that made same-sex marriage illegal in california we'll see how this was overturned eventually by the courts uh, it was proposed by a group called protectmarriage.com and a gentleman named Dennis Hollingsworth. And it was also sponsored by various religious organizations such as the Catholic Church and the Mormon Church. It passed with 52% of the vote. It was eventually declared unconstitutional. And you know what? We're going to look at this more when we get into the civil rights portion. And we'll look at the reasons why it was declared to be unconstitutional. Now, we also had somebody called Measure C here in San Diego. And I used to be a big Charger fan. I'm not anymore because they moved to L.A. But Measure C was a proposal that wanted to build a stadium and a convention center in the gas lamp by Petco Park. Right? Uh, this would cost $1.8 billion, $1 billion. We would be raising hotel taxes here from 12%, 12.5% to 16.5%. And the city would then contribute $100 I mean, $1.1 billion to build a project. Uh, the Chargers would contribute $300 million, and then the NFL would contribute $350 million. So the decision to raise this tax was placed on the ballot. And at that, you know, if we look at the pros, uh, you know, the city would be able to attract Super Bowls. You know, I've heard the NFL loves San Diego as a Super Bowl destination, and they would be put in a rotation. This usually will generate about $350 million for that weekend. Uh, Final Fours, you know, you would need some type of, of maybe a retractable roof on the stadium, which would, uh, you know, that you know generates about $300 million for a city. And even wrestling, I looked at Santa Clara when they had a wrestling thing a few years ago. It generated about $150 million for Santa Clara County. This would create jobs. Uh, when the facilities are completed, more jobs would be created. And we also kind of need to expand the, the, the convention center because prior to pre you know, before you know our pandemic every july we would have comic-con right and a lot of people from different areas of the country come to san diego for comic-con and it's been estimated that comic-con generates 700 billion 700 million dollars in revenue to the people of san diego through taxes through people staying in hotels through people shopping people spending money right some of the cons would be at this time you could only be voted by people who lived in the uh, city of san diego should we give billionaires a form of welfare? Um, are public parks, libraries more important? And at that time, you needed a two-thirds supermajority to, to pass this. Um, this has changed to 51%, but at that time, you needed a two-thirds vote. Chargers would eventually move to L.A. Uh, Comic-Con could possibly move to L.A. or Anaheim as well. Civic pride and morale will, may be damaged. A referendum is something different. A referendum is where a legislature will pass a law and then ask the people to vote on it so it's a very simple thing and here you know it doesn't happen often so take check out these links and you can see how you know rare a legislative referendum is put out so we also have to talk about the recall recall is a powerful tool that we have here in direct democracy Oops, sorry let's get down to this So uh, recalls the power of, of the voters to remove an elected official, and it could be any state officer, whether it's a governor, a lieutenant governor, secretary of state, and in some instances, judges. And also at the local level, there's recalls, and some charters within local government will dictate how they handle recalls. Here in the state of California, we use the state constitution. Um, you know, some recall examples have been... Um, Governor Gray Davis was uh, recalled in the early 2000s, which led to the election of Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
Uh, people were unhappy with Gray Davis and some of his handlings of the California economy and some of the deregulations of the utilities um, industry here. Um, we had rolling blackouts, things that really upset people. Uh, there was an attempt to uh, recall Judge Aaron Persky um, in 2018. If you don't know the Brock Turner case, I'm not going to go over it because it's a really frustrating case. So go ahead and take a look on it of your on your own when you're not really when if you're not familiar with it. Basically, he handed down an, a, a light sentence to a person who was convicted of rape. Um, the voters in Santa Clara County were upset, so they recalled him. Um, and here in California, in September of 2021, a decision was made whether or not to recall Gre Gov Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom, from the governor's office here. You know, we had questions, questions about business closures and mass mandates with regards to, you know, COVID-19. 62% um, of Californians voted to keep Newsom in office, so it didn't pass, and he stayed. Um, so just some of the requirements, uh, you need 12% of... Uh, signatures for the people that voted for that last office. So if it's a secretary of state, you would need 12% of the number of the people voted for that office. And you have to have signatures from at least five different counties. Um, and you can take a look at also what is involved in, in the recall. It doesn't happen often, but we do have experience in it. Okay.